Ezekiel 37, verses 15 to 28. 8, 7, 6. Ezekiel 37, from verse 15. Verse 15. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take a stick and write on it for Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel associated with him and join them one to another into one stick that they may become one in your hand. And when your people say to you, will you, will you not tell us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am about to take the stick of Joseph that is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I will join with it the stick of Judah and make them one stick that they may be one in my hand. When the sticks on which you write are in your hand before their eyes, then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone and will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all, and they shall be no longer two nations, and no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, and their detestable things, or with any of their transgressions. But I will save them from all the backsliding in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever, and David my servant shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, it shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will set them in their land and multiply them, and will set, will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Thierry, thank you so very much for your reading, and it's absolutely lovely to see you here, Thierry, for a, a few weeks. If you're in, when you're next in Tokyo, make sure you touch base with Thierry, get his address, he'd love to see you, he'll take you to do all sorts of wonderful things. I last uh, spent time in Tokyo watching the Japanese uh, sumo wrestling early in the morning, quite, quite wonderful, and being shown around by Thierry's fluent in Japanese, and doing, more importantly, a wonderful, wonderful work uh, over there in Tokyo. Now, our subject over the next four weeks is the kingdom of God and we've come to the final scene in one, what, what one author called the gospel according to Ezekiel and we're going to see that God promises something that really is out of this world in every sense of, of the word. Ezekiel's aim is that we have as Christian people deep confidence and informed conviction about God's promise of his kingdom and of his coming king. And if you want a title for these, uh, these talks, Hope for the Hopeless. Hope for the Hopeless. Because Ezekiel's audience uh, 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 remember the deported, despairing, and desperate exiles from the city of God, Jerusalem. And Ezekiel speaks following news of the destruction of Jerusalem. And the exiles had been dragged away to Babylon 700 miles from home. And there by the river of Babylon, they literally sat down and wept. And initially they entertained some sort of vague hope of a restoration, some sort of vague vestige of hope that they would be restored back into Jerusalem, all would be well. But if you were here earlier in the summer when we were looking at the early chapters of Ezekiel, back in chapter 33, after 32 chapters of silence, Ezekiel started to speak. The first 32 chapters, he kind of acted out his prophecies, trying to drive home the point relentlessly that all hope is over. And you'll remember he carved a brick and he lay on one side eating a kind of diet of uh, um, 
just a tiny amount, half a pound of grain and um, just a, 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 a litre of water every day. And then he rolled over on the other side and this was to symbolise the siege. And then he burrowed a hole through the side of his house in all, and carried his luggage out to symbolise exile. He, he shaved himself completely with a sharp sword, cut the hair up and scattered it to the winds to show the dispersion of the Israelites. And then in chapter 33, his wife died. And this was the final mark of coming judgment on God's people and on God's nation there in Israel. Uh, and then, uh, running into Babylon, the first fugitive, and he announces, the city has been struck down. It's really powerful, powerful stuff. And then Ezekiel's mouth is opened, and he starts speaking. So it's into this hopeless situation. The city has been destroyed. The temple has been demolished. The people have been dispersed. All hope is dashed. That Ezekiel pronounces this vision, if you like, of God's kingdom that runs from chapter 34 through to the end of the book of Ezekiel, which we've been looking at. And Ezekiel speaks of a new king, new leadership, the shepherd, chapter 34. He speaks of the new land, God's land, the land of promise, chapter 35, 36. He speaks of a new people, God's people with new hearts and God's spirit placed within them, the end of chapter 36. And then wonderful chapter 37. Do you remember the vision of bones? And he sees just all these, uh, it's a macabre picture of all these bones scattered on the ground and they're picked clean and bleached white. And then he's commanded, and, uh, and somebody asks, can these bones live? And then he speaks God's word and sinews come on the bones and then flesh comes, well the bones come together first of all and then sinews and then flesh and then uh, skin and they're still lying there dead and he speaks again and then the spirit comes into these bones and these bones are the house of Israel. And God says this dead, defunct, uh, dispersed people with all hopes dashed, there is going to be new life I want you to look at one, that last verse uh, in the first half of chapter 37 before we get into our passage, and it's there in verse 12. So, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. And then verse 13, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O people. So not only a vision of kind of new life breathed into people, but actually a vision of genuine physical resurrection. And so this is not reincarnation with the body eaten by maggots, but a soul reincarnated in a buffalo or a bumblebee or a baboon or whatever it is that Boris thinks he might be coming back as. And this is not the immortality of the soul, with the body a mouldering in the grave and the soul somehow being up there sort of in, 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 in some sort of uh, disembodied state. This is physical resurrection with physical bodies such that when you come to the New Testament, Martha is able to say to the Lord Jesus, I know my brother will rise at the resurrection. A physical resurrection is what's being promised. New life for a new people in a new land with new leadership New hearts, new hope. Hope for the hopeless. But on its own, I don't think that's quite enough. And so Ezekiel's prophecy finishes. Because you're asking, okay, where will this new resurrection people live? Who will they be? Who will lead them? What's going to be different this time? And in chapter 37, then, the closing part of chapter 37, a united kingdom, undisputed rule, everlasting presence, United Kingdom. Uh, I'm not talking about this United Kingdom, we're talking about God's United Kingdom, just in case we're sort of uh, getting that not quite straight. God's promise is of his gathering of his people who have been scattered throughout the nations and bringing them home to make them one. And the emphasis on the first few verses, verse 15 through to 22, is on God's work. This is something that he's doing. And it's on unity. 
In our translation, just in those first few verses, we've just got the word one mentioned eight times. In the original, it comes 11 times. One, 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 one. Unity. In fact, if you were marking the GCSE uh, English language paper for Ezekiel, it would be surrounded in red, you know, repetition, repetition, repetition. One stick, one in your hand, one stick, one in my hand, one nation, one king, one shepherd. In fact, verses 15 through 17, just look at them. They're almost impossible to read if you have the kind of number of ones that are actually there. Verse 16, son of man, take one stick, write on it for Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Then take one stick, write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel associated with him and join them one to one into one that they may become one in your hand. Now, can you get the point? I love it when the Bible's like that. You know, my job is really quite easy, isn't it? You know, what is the point? Unity, unity. Quite how Ezekiel acted out this prophecy. We're back into Ezekiel acting out his prophecies again. People are, you can imagine they're sitting by the road saying, oh, here we go again. What's he on this time? Quite how he acted out the prophecy, we don't really know. Were the sticks, um, as the footnote has it, kind of um, planks of wood? Or, or were they live, bare-rooted whips, if you like, grafted together like a rose or a fruit tree? Uh, we just don't know. At the time of Ezekiel, wooden planks were covered with wax and messages were written on them. And when you were wanting to put two messages together or you had a long message, you would literally join them together, fold them up and carry them under your arm like a kind of portfolio. What we do know is that the wretched division which had plagued Israel as 10 tribes of Israel had separated from Judah and Benjamin, the other two tribes, for over 450 years, is now going to be reversed. It was one of the great scandals of Israel's history and of the Old Testament. It was kind of family breakdown. It was divorce. It was sibling civil war. It was dysfunction. But rather than being acted out between two individuals, under the family home and in the civil courts. This is played out in public between the tribes of Israel, God's people, divided, rent asunder. Uh, one of the 10 tribes of Israel uh, was uh, um, Ephraim or Joseph. And, and so when it says Joseph or Ephraim, it's basically talking about the 10 tribes of Israel. And the other two, Judah and Benjamin, focused around Jerusalem. This was a kind of a, a, a horrifying division amongst the people of God, a scandal amongst the people of God. This was worse than kind of Orange Order and Republican diehards, worse than Sunni and Shia. This was the people of God rent asunder and defied, divided. And as Ezekiel writes, on both planks, both planks are given the name Israel. Did you notice that? For Judah and the people of Israel associated with him, for Joseph the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel associated with him. And verse 17, join them one to one into one that they may become one in your hand. And when the people say, will you not tell us what this means? Then God explains it in verse 18. I'm about to take the stick of Joseph that's the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel associated with him. I will join it with the stick of jo J Judah and make them one stick that they may be one in my hand. And when the sticks on which you write are in your hand before their eyes, say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone and will gather them out from all around and will bring them to their own land and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Did you notice I am, I will, I will, I will. This is God's work. Now, those of you who've come across the teaching of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which some of you may have done, the Mormons, then you will know that its founder, Joseph Smith, in 1830, identified the Book of Mormon as the stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim. And you, in those days, you'd have a stick with a scroll wrapped around it. And the stick of Judah, according to him, was the Old and New Testament. And in 1830, Joseph Smith declared that what this vision was all about was the Old and New Testament having joined to it 
his teaching. You kind of think that's a little bit uh, extreme, don't you? Especially when the text actually tells you it's about the 10 tribes of Israel being joined to the two tribes of Israel, Judah and Benjamin, so that there's one nation again. You know, when you start reading the Bible like that, you can make it say absolutely anything. It's the sort of thing that Jehovah's Witnesses do. And you really are in cloud cuckoo land. Now, what Ezekiel is speaking about is a day when reunification of the people of God will take place. The resurrected people will be a united people. And so real harmony, deep unity, lasting solidarity, disputes settled, disagreements sorted, broken relationships mended, tense, terse, eggshell walking experiences finished. No office politics, no backbiting, no backstabbing, no two-faced hypocrisy, unity, harmony. One people, one nation, one land forever. And is this not something that we all long for? I don't know about you, I hate disunity. I find disagreements extremely hard to cope with. When some of you tell me about the sort of things that go on in your offices with the kind of backbiting, kind of bitchy comments and so forth, I don't know how you survive. I personally do not enjoy confrontation for one moment. And I love the idea of unity and harmony. And what Ezekiel is holding out is this promise of one people, full accord, genuine brotherhood, sisterhood, the world at one, the world in union, the world in perfect harmony, with the people of God now united and the nations looking in. Surely God is amongst them and coming to them. But again, I think it is a wonderful image. Isn't, isn't it a wonderful image? You're not looking nearly excited enough. I don't want to try and force that on you. I just think it is a wonderful, wonderful image. But again, on its own, such an image is not sufficient. How can we know that it won't simply end up with the same old, same old? You know, God may bring his people back to the land. He may resurrect us out of our graves and bring us into this one united people. But how can we be sure it won't just kind of Be the same old, same old once we get together. And there we have verse 22, the undisputed king. So halfway through verse 22. And one king shall be over them, and they shall be no longer two nations, and no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols and their detestable things, or with any of their transgressions, but I will save them from all the backsliding in which they have sinned and will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. No longer shall they walk in, uh, they shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. Now, already we've read of new hearts, haven't we? Back in Ezekiel 36, God has promised to remove from his people our hearts of stone and put in place a heart of flesh. This is a kind of spiritual cardiovascular surgery that God is going to do on his people. But here God promises now one king over all his people such that this new people with their cleansed hearts, with his Holy Spirit dwelling within them, will live and dwell in unspoiled union under the undisputed rule. Notice there's external authority, one king, and internal morality. I will save them, I will cleanse them, they will not defile themselves, they'll walk in my rules. And those two things, a willing spirit, I want to walk in your rules, and then an absolute ruler who is good, are are fundamental to dwelling in perfect harmony. The king is after the line of David. There's continuity. The king is a shepherd. There's care. The king is a servant. That means he will do perfectly the will of God and therefore serve God and us perfectly. The king is untouched by death. Did you notice that? Over and again, the king is forevermore. He's on the throne forever. It will go on to eternity. And so here we have the one undisputed external authority 
Unity, authority, and internal morality. There can be no unity while there's anarchy. I mean, we know that. You cannot have unity while there's anarchy. There can be no harmony when there remains me following my little way and you following your little way. There can be no harmony. It can't happen. We long for unity. We love harmony. Is that not one of the reasons why we want authority? But no authority actually lives up to it. But this is a king after the line of David. This is a king who is a good shepherd. This is a king who is untouched by death. It's not going to be four more years, four more years, and then bust. This is a king who will be forever good and perfect and kind and warranting our surrender. But for so long as we go on in our own little camps, you can never have unity. Some of us are going to go away... um, Uh, on holiday for the summer school in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, It's a great time. If you haven't managed to book in this year, then come next year, bring your family. It's always an absolutely fantastic time. You don't have to bring your family if you haven't got one. You don't have to kind of adopt a family or anything like that. Just come. It's always a great holiday. I remember remember very vividly last summer, I was sitting uh, after lunch, enjoying myself in the sunshine, chatting away, and there were two kids playing just on the the green, just uh, after one of them, he will remain nameless. One of my favorite boys in St. Helens, a lovely kid. He looked at this other guy. The other guy had something he wanted. He grabbed it, bashed him over the head with it, pushed him like that, and then stalked off. His mother saw, and she stepped in, and then there was harmony. But of course, if the other mother had seen the other one, and they both taken sides, then immediately he would have had a punch up, and then others had taken sides, and he would have escalated. You can have no unity when there's no actual authority. I mean, basically, that's being played out in the city every day, isn't it? And all over the world. But here, these resurrected people of God come together as one under one ruler. Your longing for union and harmony will never happen until you surrender to a perfect ruler, King Jesus. But there's also inner transformation. You can see that in verse 23, 24. It's there, my servant shall be king over them, verse 24. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. So there's a an internal decision of the will now. People are going to be glad to surrender to Jesus rather than doing it reluctantly or whatever. And so we have this image, don't we, of perfect union, moral purity, unity, harmony. Two leaders disunited, civil war. No nation divided against itself can stand. The Barclays boardroom meshed in squabbles can only diminish the brand but a nation, and a, a nation diseased by internal moral compromise will always ultimately collapse. A nation diseased by internal moral compromise will ultimately collapse. One of the things I'm going to do on my summer holidays after we went to the summer school and take off is cut up this huge tree that's come down, vast great tree down on the place where I go in the West Country. I'm looking forward to doing it. I've already made one incision. I know what went wrong. It's a huge, great uh, beech tree, but in the winds, it just came crashing down. Make an incision, you can see why. It's rotten in the middle. Looked fine, rotten in the middle. No internal morality, no real revolution from within. Ultimately, it will come crashing down. So authority, morality, resurrection, unity. Did you notice verse 25? It's just such a beautiful picture in verse 25. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children, their children's children, shall dwell there forever, and David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. It Again, it's a beautiful image. They and their children, their ch- children's children, parents and grandparents, children and children's children, dwelling in harmony with the king amongst them, the perfect king. And we haven't even got to verse 26, 27, and 8, where we find God himself dwelling amongst his people, with them in person, 
making a covenant of peace with them that is everlasting. Here then is the hope that Ezekiel holds out to these exiles. Hope for the hopeless, for those who are despairing of all hope. It's in the language and the categories of Ezekiel, of course, because that's what they would have understood. He speaks in terms of the land. That's because he's an Israelite. He talks in terms of the ten tribes of Israel and the two tribes of Judah. Yeah, that's because he's from Jerusalem. He talks in terms of the temple and presence. And so well, that's because he's a priest. But a resurrected people, a reunited people, a ruled people, a reformed people, and a reconciled people. That's what it's about. And do we not long for it? Unity, don't you long for it? Harmony, don't you treasure it? Authority, don't you actually cry out for it? Morality, don't you detest it when you find hypocrisy? Eternity, how we crave it, my legacy. This is just the stuff of dreamers. I can hear somebody saying, yeah, of course Ezekiel had dreams like that. He was sitting in the mud flats in Babylon between January the 8th and April the 28th, 585 and 573 BC. That's the kind of thing you think when you're sitting in the mud flats. What on earth had he been smoking, you say to yourself? Or perhaps the mushrooms were particularly strong on the mud flats of Babylon. No. As we come to the Christian Gospels, we find the Lord Jesus Christ. If you just turn to chapter 10, verse 15 and 16 of John, on page 1081, we've got one minute left and we'll look at it. John 10, 15 and 16. One o eight one. We'll take it from verse 14. Here is Jesus. I am the good shepherd. Sound familiar? I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, the good shepherd. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. And Jesus does go on to lay down his life for the sheep and to rise from the grave so that you and I have on the table of history before us today the living Lord Jesus, the first fruits of those raised from the grave, who is in the process of calling people to himself from across the world to this great hope beyond this world. And so as we close, I've got to ask you this question. What are you hoping for? I've told you what I'm hoping for, and it's got solid substance. Substance because of Jesus' resurrection from the grave. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. And to show you that I am the true king of God's people, here I am, raised from the grave, says Jesus Christ, gathering people from across the world. Well, what are you hoping for? My hope has real substance. Is your hope in just sort of liberalism? Well, I, there's something truth in what Putin said. It's pretty much a busted flush. Is it in capitalism? Or is your hope just in little me? I'm going to bumble through life as little me and who knows what might happen. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what will happen. You'll end in the grave. And where does your hope go then? Hope for the hopeless. There is something really worth living for and that's Jesus Christ and he offers you real hope and it's a fulfillment of everything we've looked at for the last 20 minutes. Let me lead us in prayer. They will be one people, one shepherd, my servant David, king over them. They will be my people and I will be their God. Our Father in heaven, how we praise you, surrounded by such hopelessness in so many spheres, wherever we look, disunity, disharmony, broken relationships, we praise you for the beauty of this glorious and wonderful vision of the Good Shepherd. And we praise you for the Lord Jesus and his defeat of death, the prospect of life beyond the grave uh, with changed hearts and united as one people under his perfect rule. 
And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.